the community, but also by the planners and the decision makers. So I will just give you this uh, a few worded quote that technology owes an apology to ecology. Uh, what is your opinion? I think in the end, uh, uh, a few of you may be able to tell me whether this is correct or not. Because if we stop the technological de uh, development, will ecology return to its natural cycle and will it be feasible for the generation of human beings? Or if we have to go ahead with the technology, is it going to be of harm and of no benefit all the time? So this is something you see, which you will ponder upon and let me know in the end. Well, climate change has been a natural phenomenon, you see. It's not that the current climate change, you see, it is the only climate change because of the human intervention. It has been a natural phenomenon and there has been, uh, you see, involvement of uh, uh, oceanic circulation, the role of the uh, plants and trees, the sun, its radiation, and also of the uh, volcanic activity, plate tectonics, etc. But nowadays, when we say the climate change effects, we always specifically talk of the human-induced alteration of the environment of the natural world. So this effect is currently causes global warming. Otherwise, climate change in its natural pattern was going there. As you have been hearing that there was ice age on this earth, you see, many, many years back, maybe some millions of years back. So we have to see that what we are doing as human beings and how we are going to control it. What is the uh, controlling factor which are available uh, with us? So, first of all, let's have a look at the temperatures. It is very important, you see, that uh, what kind of temperatures we are talking about. If you see at the figure on the left-hand side, so here we see that in black are the observed temperatures. In brown line are the temperatures which are uh, which have been measured you see simulated because of the human uh, intervention and the natural reasons and separately in the blue line is the is indicating the temperatures because of the natural processes so black line black curve indicates the cumulative effect of the uh, human in intervention the natural system and you see uh, everything you see, you can see, we know that the Industrial Revolution took place from 1760 to 1840. So we can say that there was some kind of uh, stability in the overall temperature on the globe as it was measured. Uh, and afterwards, you see, uh, there has been a slight increase and then there is an abrupt increase, you see, uh, in, the, in the temperature rising effect, uh, dating from, you can say, mm, something like uh, 19th end of 19th century and on the right hand side you can see the blue curve and the red curve so indirect temperature measurements you see have been shown you see in blue and the direct measurements after 1880 uh, with instruments with thermometers or whatever but you can see the steep climb in the temperature if we see the value of rise, well, it is like of the order of slightly more than a degree. But you see, if it keeps rising at this uh, at this uh, level, you see like this in this state, ultimately a few degrees rise can play havoc uh, with the systems on the earth. So one factor of the climate change is the temperature rise. Second is the uh, depletion of oxygen. We know that uh, oxygen in our Earth's atmosphere is like 21% and uh, nitrogen is about 78%. So, till now, in a matter of like uh, 800,000 years, oxygen has depleted by only 0.7%. So, it is not considered to be very serious. So, life, But life on Earth doesn't need any higher amount of oxygen. It's okay. However, if the Earth loses its oxygen or there is an appreciable reduction, then it will become a difficult place, a dangerous place to live. So, one thing was the temperature rise phenomenon because of several factors, that slight depletion of oxygen, 
and third is the emission of carbon dioxide you see you look at the figure and it is you see crystal clear that uh, if you want to see the atmospheric carbon dioxide plotted on the left hand vertical scale in parts per million you can see that the rise has been significant you see uh, well after in the beginning from the beginning of the 20th century and then very steep curve after uh, say 1980s <coughs> or 1970s or so and similarly if we talk at the emissions in billions of tons then we can see uh, uh, after you see well around 1960 and beyond that there has been a steep rise uh, billions of tons you see you can say like 37 38 billion tons you see in according in year 2020 and if you look at the particulate method parts per million well uh, around 410 uh, ppm as recorded in 2020 so this is the carbon dioxide emission and here you see that steep part shown earlier plotted separately starting from around uh, 1975 to 2020 so we see that from uh, slightly above 330 to more than 410 ppm so this is this has happened in a matter of like uh, 45 years carbon dioxide abundance is taking place now these gases the carbon dioxide gas itself carbon particles i mean the methane which is you see present and the chlorofluorocarbons which we were which are released and even the water vapor the water molecule which uh, are becoming excessive you see these all particles you see uh, when they are present in the air in abundance they act as a reflecting medium you see and it's not that the sun ray which comes to the earth is reflected back directly it is intercepted by these particles in between and in that process there are multiple reflections as you can see in the right hand figure so multiple reflection causes the heat to be trapped within the atmosphere and that is what is called the greenhouse effect so some sunlight that hits the earth is reflected and some becomes heat and these gases you see they are acting continuously the more is the abundance of these gases more is the heating effect which is trapped on earth in order to further understand this you can see here that there is an effect of ozone also the earth atmosphere which is said to be 6 to 20 kilometer thick around the earth itself is called troposphere and we are talking of the gases you see in that and then in the stratosphere there is a thin layer a very thin layer of ozone which is being removed by the effect of these chlorofluorocarbons and those gases you see so resulting into uh, penetration of the heat more heat from the sun number one and penetration of the ultraviolet rays affecting the health of the uh, living beings here on earth you can see uh, very clearly very evidently here so also in this figure you can see the the effect of the chlorofluorocarbons you see uh, our aerosols and our, our fertilizer sprays and our perfumes etc they are all branded as chlorofluorocarbons so they result into reduction in the thickness of ozone layer which is fairly thin and it is allowing direct uh, penetration of the sun rays means more heat number one and number two uh, travel of the ultraviolet rays uh, on earth and affecting every type of life including animals and plants and whatever you think but here you see again on the top ozone layer lies 20 to 30 kilometer above earth and will reduce to 3 mm if squeezed into a single layer of course its thickness is a bit variable uh, there have been many models of temperature you see which have been studied but if uh, very aggressive mitigative measures are taken then perhaps the trend of the temperature rise 
will be sh uh, as shown in uh, part C in the figure C. And if it is not mitigated at all, then perhaps the trend continues as per line A. And by taking intermediate steps, the trend of the temperature rise may follow the pattern B. So there have been model studies to see that what kind of different, what kind of effects different measures can have. Uh, here you can see again, uh, sea level rise phenomenon has been studied by different models. Different models had different assumptions that how, if you look at the horizontal axis and Today we are living in the year 2024 and it has been projected up to 2100, up to end of this century. So you can see there have to be some aggressive measures as per the model say you can see A and C you see they will cause a little rise in the water level, sea water level. Why sea water level rises? When there is increased warmth, when there is increase in temperature, more ice melting more water flowing from the mountains by melting of the snow cover into the river and then reaching sea. So that is the uh, basic cause of uh, sea, sea level rise. But at the background, the temperature rise is a big phenomenon which is causing this. Now, I think you might have heard, some of you might have heard of these two weather phenomena. One is called La Nina, it's a Spanish word by meaning a girl child or little girl. So it is used for that natural weather condition which uh, causes you see uh, uh, some currents in the Pacific Ocean to travel in a direction in a certain direction but the effect is that the temperatures in the eastern Pacific near equator of the course of South America you see that is uh, characterized by you see uh, unusual winds and uh, cooler cooler temperature than usual uh, well even in nature without the human intervention i mean without the anthropogenic effect the human intervention related effects are called anthropogenic effects so without those interventions nature had its own uh, cycles of uh, increasing temperature, decreasing temperature because of the natural effects. But now the human intervention has superimposed and is changing it frequently. So La Nina phenomenon is, uh, you see if I show you the next slide, here you can see, I think I'm moving arrow here, you can see this is South America, this is North America, and this is the red line is the equator line. So you see, this is the Pacific Ocean. Pacific Ocean, we can see this blue zone is the cooler zone. So here you see increased trade winds, cooler winds travel from this direction to this direction. This is a hotter wind area, okay? So this is how the cycle is shown to work. Cooler and then hotter airs traveling back, you know, like this. So, it is characterized by stronger than usual east to west winds. But you see, this hampers, uh, cool airs would hamper the cloud formation, leading to dry conditions also in some areas. So, the studies show that this phenomenon uh, repeats every two to seven years and may last like one to three years. So, here you have seen the La Nina condition. And here, if you see the uh, United States of America, if you see here, yeah, Houston, Atlanta, Denver, and Chicago, you see. So different conditions at different places. Here it is written warmer, this part, drier, colder, wetter. The greens are wetter, the blues are colder, blue zones, and this purple are shown as the warm zone then the dry zone so this is how it is affecting and this is what is it's happening and this is affecting the rainfall pattern also and if you see in the globe of this earth you see the drier portion wet dry and wet you see when there is a dry area less rainfall will there will be drought and in the wet zone there is, will be more flooding, more rainfall, more water in the rivers ultimately traveling to sea. 
So this is how La Nina phenomenon is affecting rainfall and hence flooding or drought condition and uh, as such you see uh, having many bad effects like one bad effect is on the crops less uh, crops produce you see low agricultural activity so of course La Nina rainfall and floods that they are then opposite to this phenomenon is called El Nino. It is directly reverse of that. In Spanish language, this term is used for the little boy compared to the little girl. So here, in the uh, from the east of Pacific, you see near the equator, the hotter there is a hotter environment. You see in this phenomenon, it reverses. This causes warmer water temperatures in the eastern and central Pacific region. So heavy rainfall will take place in the east as, as a consequence. And there will be flooding and drought in Indonesia and Australia as it is predicted. So large changes are taking place and like La Nina, the El Nino phenomenon is also having, having its cycles. It occurs every two to seven years and may last like one to three years. Here you can see uh, La, normal year, upper upper figure shows normal year where is, there is some, you see, natural circulation of cold and hot air. But here you see, uh, the, the equator will be somewhere here. Uh, in the eastern part of Pacific, this is Pacific Ocean, you see the warmer air compared to the colder air, you see. So, the you can see the current of hot air traveling here, you see. So this area becomes hotter compared to the normal air. So certain areas have droughts in this phenomenon also. And uh, there will be some, of course, uh, wetter zones also somewhere. Now, what is the impact of these climate change phenomena or climate change which is taking place on La Nina and El Nino? Because had the climate change because of the anthropogenic reasons not been there, even as per the natural cycle, some La Nina and some El Nino effects would have been there. But are they being affected by this climate change? The phenomenon are considered to be an outcome of complex natural climate factors. So the studies continue and there is no clear-cut evidence that what is the effect of the anthropogenic phenomenon, climate change factors, on changing the La Nina and El Nino patterns. So let us see what comes in the future. Because the study in detail on climate change factors was given importance quite later, quite late. Like in the, you can say, in the end of the last century, more awareness started coming. Now, if we talk of our country, Pakistan, then the predictions have been that this winter uh, is going to be more severe and harsh. And uh, longer winters, low temperatures, more snowfall in the north and heavy rainfall. I think so far as the low temperatures are concerned, we, we, we are seeing there. In our country, you see, we are, we are feeling that effect that right now the winters are quite aggressive this time. So this is El Nino, said to be El Nino phenomenon <laughs> in progress. I think you agree with this, that some effect is there. Though, uh, you see, there are three factors in uh, this uh, low temperatures, uh, which are continuing, you see, for longer time. The winter itself, winter is cold. Then the El Nino phenomenon taking place during this spell and this deep solar minimum, less heat being generated by sun itself. So there are cycles and periods in the sun's activity too. So it is called deep solar minimum. So they, these three effects cumulatively, you see, they are reducing the temperatures and causing cold weather in many regions. Uh, environmental hazards in mountains. So mountains are generally steep and you, we know that uh, tectonically active and prone to earthquakes, of course, when there is a steep slope or when there are slopes. 
sliding can take place or tectonic movements are more pronounced you see because of uh, uh, you can say uh, uh, disturbance in the equilibrium of forces so storms and heavy precipitations with gravity can unleash fast hazards like landslides, like floods, like avalanches, and like glove. Well, glove is a glacial lake outburst flood. The flood which is resulted from the glacial lakes from the mountains up in the north where there is the glacial activity. So these events which are glove our northern area is rampant with the glove activity and many uh, streams and uh, are identified. There are thousands in numbers where the glove activity would be there. But some of them are very critical. So they can release millions and millions of cubic meters of uh, snow and water you see all of a sudden. So due to rising temperature, glaciers in Pakistan's mountains are melting rapidly and a total of uh, more than 3,000 glacial lakes have been identified. They have been developed in Gilgit, Baltistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa area, more than 3,000. So of these, so far 33 glacial lakes have been assessed to be prone to hazardous glacial lake outburst flooding, GLOF. So they are sudden events, they don't give any warning and can release millions of cubic meters of water and debris, leading to, of course, loss of life, property, and whatever comes on the way. So many millions of people are affected in Gilgit, Pakistan, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa area because of this. It is said to be more than 7 million. So this is the activity of GLOF, which is very much rampant in the northern areas of Pakistan. In the last year, which has just passed, so maximum temperature, let's look at this figure, it used to be like 40 degrees centigrade in Chitral and Kilgit, Baltistan in the summers, but this year it has risen to 43 degrees, means the summer was unusual, the temperatures rose by 3 degrees. So what do we expect? More melting of snow and more water. So uh, more flooding more water reaching sea, more erosions, probably more landsliding. This led to speedy melting of snow and ice in the mountains. So, of course, heavy rainfalls and many glacial lakes burst suddenly, causing floods which damage bridges and other properties, you see, whatever we effect. Now, uh, let us have a look at the history of this climate change phenomenon study. If we go back to 19th century, some regional changes were, you see, observed in the old, in the antique, you see, studies. And then paleoclimate change and theories of its causes were also, you see, uh, being taken actively during 19th century Paleoclimate changes mean the changes in the climate which are measured, you see, or assessed without the instruments which are present today. So, afterwards, in the end of the 19th century, just close to end, some calculations were made for the first time to know the greenhouse effect, that this is something which is really present. It's not a hoax. So, this was started to be understood. Then paleoclimates and sun spores, spots, they were studied that there are some spots in the sun. So solar minimum, that would mean less heat generated by sun because of the solar spots. So we can say in the 20th century, up to the mid of the 20th century, this phenomenon, these phenomena were studied and understood. And then it is after 1950s, up to 1960s in the next decade, some concern was indicated by the expert that there is something, something is brewing up. Some climate change effect is going and going to affect the earth. Then scientists increasingly started predicting the warming during 1970s and then 
among scientists of various countries, they started having a kind of consensus that yes, they, that is, there is something now. There is a greenhouse effect and that is causing temperature rise and more snow melting. So this took place between 1980 and 88 and beyond 88 we call that the uh, modern area, modern era or modern period. And then subsequently other factors which can influence the climate change have also been found out which we are discussing today. Let's talk of the trend of the climate change. So observations since 1950 indicate increases in some forms of extreme weather events. So a special report has been issued on extreme events and disasters, SREX, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change called IPCC. This predicts, this is serious, this predicts further increases in the 21st century I mean, climate change is going to perhaps increase further in the 21st century, including a growing frequency in heat waves, rising wind speed of tropical cyclones, very cold spells, and increasing intensity of droughts. So these are serious indicators. And of course, each of these are going to have our civil infrastructure, going to affect our civil infrastructure, our cropping pattern, our way of living, and everything. A one in, now this is, you see, as an example, a one in 20 years hottest day event. I mean, the hottest day event, which in the past used to take place after 20 years, now is expected in this century every other year. So this is not good. Heavy precipitation events are also on the rise now. So, potentially impacting the frequency of floods and almost means of heavy floods will be coming more frequently and almost certainly increasing landslides. So, landslide activity will be more pronounced. Erosion activity will be more pronounced. Let's have a look at the human-induced drivers which affect the climate change, the anthropogenic drivers. So the largest driver is said to be the emission of greenhouse gases, uh, in which 90% role is of carbon dioxide and methane. And this fossil fuels uh, for energy consumption is one of the big source for this. Of course, we know with the modern traffic, you see, there's a lot of uh, uh, carbon dioxide and emission to and besides the uh, you see some deforestation industrial processes more factories you see although it, effort is made in sometimes to curtail the carbon dioxide emissions by using appropriate filters in the chimneys so temperature rise is accelerated or tempered by climate feedbacks too so loss of sunlight reflecting snow and ice cover when there is more heat in the globe on this earth then more water uh, more snow will be melted on the mountains so this means or that on one side more water will be generated on the river and on the other side some sunlight reflecting reflection of sunlight will be less you see because snow cover has reduced so this is also going to have an effect in other way. Increased water vapor because of the, the water vapor itself is also a greenhouse gas, as I told you, in addition to carbon dioxide and methane. And changes to land and ocean carbon sinks because, you see, uh, we, we say that uh, the, we, if we have more land and more vegetation, so that vegetation acts as carbon sink. And if there's a water body which shrinks or increases in size, that's, that is also going to alter the uh, relative distribution of the sinks on the globe Earth. Now, after having said that, having commented on the climate change factors, what geohazards are we expecting or we are observing or which are taking place? Number one, because of the rise in the sea level and more tidal activity, Coast, 
coastal erosions and the cliff retreat. retreat. Uh, debris, earth, mud flows, the flows which contain soil and rock particles also in wet condition. Storms, dust storms carrying dust. Earth fissures, the cracks in the earth, you see, in addition to the existing uh, fissures, more fissures, because the drier condition will induce more fissures, number one. The tectonic movement, that movement of the plates on which the continents are said to be uh, based will also be uh, different. Then the soils which, because of their special mineralogy, expand on addition of water because of their particular chemistry, they will be having more expansion, gain in volume, hence affecting the infrastructure which is constructed over such soils. The lighter the structure, the more damage will be. Then cars features in the limestone, you see when there is more water flowing, some limestones have, you see, higher order of solubility. So that creates a kind of void-like structure. Big cavities and voids, those will be formed in the countries or in the location where we have such limestones. Of course, landslide activity. Why? Because when there is more rainfall, more water ingresses into the slopes, reducing the effective stresses, increasing the pore water pressure, thereby facilitating mass movement downwards, which we call landslide. So similarly, the lake of action, the areas which have sands and in a loose to medium dense condition and also the earthquake activity, seismic activity is there. If they get wet, and earlier they were dry, but getting wet, upon shaking, the particles will develop excessive pore water pressure, thereby physically losing the contact for a few moments in which the soil will behave like a liquid and the whole structure may sink or tilt excessively. The soil get kind of liquefied during the repeated application of the psychic load as the earthquake load, which is applied very quickly in numerous cycles. And even the permeable sands, which are having high permeability, the loading is so quick that, say, if you talk of the first uh, loading cycle, it develops some pore water pressure. The pore water pressure, because of the high permeability, would tend to be released, would tend to be dissipated. But so high is the rate of the application of load that during the second cycle, first cycle induced some pore water pressure. It was not relieved totally that the second cycle was applied. And again, some pore water pressure added to that. And again, there was third cycle. So in this cyclic pattern, the pore water pressure gradually accumulates. The high permeability ground is not capable to relieve the pore water pressure effectively at the stage reaches when the pore water pressure actually equal to the total stress of the ground. So at that moment, the effective strength or effective stress within the ground is said to be zero. So physically that means that the grains which were in contact with each other, they lose their physical contact. They get separated because of the excessive pressure of water within the system. This is when we say the soil is liquefied. Then there are rock falls and topples effects, of course, because of the weathering effects, high temperatures, low temperatures, and the water movement effects. And we see the rockfall and toppling movements on our Karakoram Highway where the geology is different. We have uh, igneous rocks there and metamorphic rocks there compared to our, uh, well, uh, Kashmir, Mari, Kohala areas where we have soft rocks in which the water physically plays havoc. Compared to that, you see the phenomenon of rockfall and topples on uh, Karakoram Highway and in our northern areas like Skardu, Gilgit area, etc., Chilas, that is a bit different. The scouring itself, when there is more flow in the stream, in the river, and there is high speed also, depending on the bed slope and the quantity of water which, which it is taking, 
there would be more increased covering. When there is covering, you see the structures which are present there, they will, you know, uh, get damaged. They may collapse. And there could be, you see, fall of the banks of the river, you see also because of the Morse covering effect. So future designs to take care of Morse covering means more expensive designs. If the scour depth is considered to be more, you have to have more expense on the foundation system. The seismic induced ground shaking, you see, and seismic induced lateral spreads. These are the additional geohazards. One is the natural shaking. Had the climate change, anthropogenic climate change factors not there. But as I told you, that uh, when there's a snow melt, the load is shifted from the mountain partly to the sea and to the rivers. So on the planet Earth, there is a readjustment of the loads, which has its effect on the tectonic plates, which you see are sliding uh, past each other at a very slow rate, a few centimeters per year. But when the load is shifted, then movement pattern is disturbed. Hence, we should expect a different pattern of earthquakes because of the climate change effects. And there are some permanent ground deformations too. You see, there are excessive settlements or upheavals and subsidence. Uh, some soils are collapsible, uh, which have quasi-stable uh, bonds, you see, uh, at the contact points, which give way upon addition of water. And then there is a big magnitude of sudden collapse slope erosion etc so i have just highlighted a large number of geohazards which we can link and which are in fact in reality linked to uh, with the climate change effects now let's see a few flow diagrams which will give you a very good picture uh, of the climate change phenomenon emission of greenhouse gases you see if they are there like uh, we talk of carbon dioxide we talk of uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, methane, and other things. So, now on the one hand, there is ozone depletion, and which may cause diseases, and direct penetration of the sun rays. And second is the global warming, because of number one, direct penetration of the sun rays, and secondly, because of the greenhouse effect, the suspended <coughs> carbon particles and, you know, uh, these water vapors and chlorofluorocarbons, they uh, act as the reflecting medium. So that all results into the retention of more heat. So that would cause glacial melting if heat is more there. And increased uh, river flow would be there then. What it can cause, number one, floods and erosion and landsliding and rise in the sea level. And another effect is that harsh and change weathers would bring heavy rainfall and snowfall and droughts in different parts of the world in the new redistributed patterns. So you see, this conveys you a lot. Then uh, there is La Nina and El Nino phenomenon when they take place. I told you earlier that uh, they are repeated continuously at a pattern of two to seven years and may last for one to three years. So, of course, what do they bring? They redistribute the weather extremities and their effects on different parts of the globe, like excessive rain and snowfall and floods and droughts, you see. The locations of this uh, uh, critical weather phenomena keeps shifting. Now, uh, have a look at this slide. Let's draw a contrast between uh, the hazard, the risk, the vulnerability, and the disaster. So you can see this hazard is ha hazard is something that can cause harm, right? So it is a source of a potential damage or harm, right? Like we say, flood is a hazard. Like uh, land sliding is a hazard. Erosion is a hazard, right? And risk is the chance or the probability or of causing some harm, of inflicting some harm, which may be, uh, <clears throat> risk may be high or risk may be low. So any a hazard may cause a low risk situation or a high risk situation 
okay so you understand the difference between hazard and risk and the vulnerability it is the extent of damage less damage or too much excessive damage that can be caused so it has been expressed by experts that uh, uh, mathematically risk minus capacity the risk you see the probability of inflicting some harm minus the capacity of the system that there is a probability that it will be able to uh, uh, sustain uh, uh, the uh, occurrence of the hazard up to this limit so you subtract that from that and then multiply the hazard with the vulnerability and in the, into the exposure exposure time and we call this ultimately disaster this is disaster so it was important to show you this kind of uh, interrelationship because these terms are not interchangeable they have different meanings to understand these effects you see which are related to climate change you must have the true understanding i think after my lecture as i have given you some brainstorming on this a food for thought you can think over this ponder over this in your own time to further uh, understand the difference between them so as i told you hazards so you can see different hazards taking place there you see earthquake the cyclone the flood the tornado etc etc so oh, this slide shows hazard versus, versus risk on the left hand side a hazard is something that has the potential to harm you and risk is the likelihood of a hazard causing harm i think it is very clear now now it's interesting to see how cities contribute to disasters uh worldwide uh, as per statistics cities today occupy only 2% of the total land if we talk in terms of area rest 98% area is not the cities so this 2% of land that contributes to about 70% of economy 60% over 60% of global energy consumption is there in that 2% area <laughs> in cities 70% greenhouse gas emission because more humans are there so they are having the anthropogenic effect and they are also generating this 2% area where people are living 70% global waste so you can see the plight how climate forces the geological hazards we have seen that it does affect and have been uh, giving you examples so it can generate because of this climate change effect the human induced effect causing climate change it can cause disasters like earthquakes like tsunamis floods volcanic eruptions and landslides and these ultimately increase the risk of natural hazards in a warmer world god has created this world you see to live in its own way there are natural cycles we are poking in the in that natural cycle so it is said that the effects are going to be deep if we don't mitigate them changing climate does not simply involve the atmosphere and hydrosphere atmosphere is the air medium uh, the hydrosphere is the water bodies but also elicits potentially hazardous response that is the geo hazard mm -hmm. the solid earth i mean soil and rock mass of, of uh, derived from the uh, geosphere so all the three spheres are affecting you see and are affected too due to the climate change phenomenon the water bodies the atmosphere and the earth itself on the planet now let's have a look at this interesting slides floods and erosion because of the climate change effect on the left hand side you see various phenomena which we are causing today we are causing deforestation because of development air pollution is increasing because of industrial emissions and other things heat generation is there fossil fuel but by many sources in fact every human being is also a heat engine every living organism every animal is a small heat engine 
so change of land use pattern etc so what that is causing a rise in temperature the rise in temperature has two effects number one more water vapors hence heavy rainfall and uh, floods and erosion and second is the glacial melting because of rising temperature it can give rise to glough or more water in the river and again two phenomenon rise in the sea level because water will be approaching the river or the river floods and erosion or uh, erosion in the sea itself flooding and erosion in sea also can take place so you should also keep in mind that there has been urban flooding phenomenon observed in different cities of pakistan particularly karachi and lahore uh, so the outcome of the poor you see they are generally outcome of poor drainage i think one climate change effect was also said to be in islamabad where some housing development had taken place to block a natural drain so the poor drainage and the poor planning are the main reasons for the urban flooding uh, the modern architecture is creating too much impervious uh, landscape uh, which needs to be revisited and reconsidered we must concentrate on the previous uh, development you see so there are various ways and means which are outside the scope of today's talk if we talk about the landslides uh, i can refer to heavy rainfall in using more landslides and floods causing undercutting more landslides and deforestation the absence of uh, plants this support the the roots support the upper mass of soil against instability so that also may generate landslides heavy rainfall is very clear more water will seep into the slope that will cause increase in pore water pressure and reduction in the effective stress and of course landslides in the stability model uh, the destabilizing forces would be increased and the stabilizing forces the supporting forces will reduce i told earlier to how shrinking and swelling they are both linked with you see uh, water content if there is excessive rainfall swelling if there is little or no rainfall drought and when drought is there we should expect shrinkage the reverse phenomenon although for the same soil shrinking and swelling has not exactly mirror image type i mean uh, phenomenon which are exactly equal when there is swelling because of increase in water and say there is a uh, vol a uh, cubic feet volume increase the reduction in the volume will not be a cubic feet upon uh, uh, shrinkage you see so they are not mirror image like phenomena this is what I, because soil is not a very elastic medium you can say in other words also collapsibility is property of those soils which have a quasi stable structure and uh, where the particles are connected at the connection point with the soluble salt or you know uh, seals and clay in the dry environment which can just give way which can just get off upon addition of water so such settlements in the collapsible soils are sudden and more is the load or weight of the structure more of uh, weight of the civil war more will be the uh, quantity of the collapse is very serious our structures cannot absorb you see the sudden settlements and sudden strains so quickly they are never designed like that so this can create a lot of damage how seismicity and liquefaction are related uh basically number one if there's more erosion or more water bodies and glacial melting all these phenomena cause shifting of the weights right when shifting of the weight on this globe earth will be there and it is taking place change tectonic movement pattern will emerge which will be different from the natural so earthquakes If earthquakes are there, we can expect liquefaction and other damages too. Diseases. So, because of the ozone effect and because of the presence of more carbon dioxide and methane in the air, 
One is the pulmonary diseases, the diseases of lungs, cough and sinuses, and then because of the thinning of the ozone layer, more ultraviolet rays and heat, more skin cancer. This means the effects of the climate change to cause geohazards is very serious. And uh, there is an indication in the worldwide studies that such events, if not controlled properly, are going to increase in magnitude. So they are going to eat up the global economy. Well, if we argue that rich nations have a lot of money at stake, but the poor, the poor countries, they don't have much money. This means there will be very, very bad secondary effects. So rural and urban communities have different resilience patterns in the event of the extreme climate changes. So this means that the strategies for their mitigation in the two types of communities will be different. Resilience, or you can say the resistance to this issue in rural areas is governed mostly by social parameters. That is by adaptation, reorganization, improving sustainability. Right? You adapt to the to that better. You reorganize and make some changes like that. But in urban population, resilience is governed by economic parameters like economic development to avoid recover from and withstand hazard. Right? So that is the basic difference. Magnification of hazard risk by climate change. Hazard risk, I mean, probability of uh, hazard taking place is magnified by climate change. It is much more increased. The vulnerability also, while at the same time decreasing the resilience of household and communities. So all goes bad. In addition to these, it's not only the geohazards. I will give you a slight insight into what social uh, damages do take place because of the climate change effect. That is something, because that is something to be considered by planners, by policy makers, by decision makers, by governments. Destruction of property, loss of financial resources and personal injuries and illness can lead to, because the, this is what climate change is going to produce. Migration of uh, inhabitation from one point to the other, that this is no good area. So, when you shift or migrate, you see, it has its own psychological and financial issues. Mental health issues, because people will start developing mental stress if they lose their property, if they lose their financial resources, that kind of situation will be there. Alcohol misuse. Alcohol misuse may start, you see, in those areas where people are too much affected. And as a consequence, domestic violence could be there where people will be losing their temperaments. So this will give rise to a society with uncontrolled, I mean, emotions also. Chronic diseases may spread out. There will be unemployment, which may be short term or long term, depending on the government's policies. But on the whole, there will be increase in poverty. And the rich nations can cope with this more effectively and the poor nations find it very difficult because money makes a mere go. They will need more money and they will not have more money. So economic impacts reduce business activities because of this. Increase imports because if the production goes on, uh, low, the industries stop somewhere. So you will have to rely on importing. Means more budget to be spent on importing. Or on forex, it will be having an effect. Reduce agricultural yield due to flooding and raised temperature. Reduce manufacturing and, and services sectors. Reduce exports. Reduce fisheries and livestock. Income inequalities. Reduce GDP, your national economic factor. Impact on water resources and water scarcity, expenditure and reconstruction. So you see, there are so many effects. Climate change is not only the geohazards, it's going to have an overall very bad effect on this whole system. And this mere one degree or two degrees rise is not small. 
it must raise the eyebrows of the planners, of the engineers, of the uh, architects, of the professionals. So here you see climate change and disaster. On the left hand side, if you see uh, climate, either natural variability or anthropogenic, anthropologic climate change. Okay. So this gives rise to weather and climate change effects. Vulnerability of those, how much is the extent and exposure, how much it is exposed to that. So, a uh, disaster with certain risk factor, high or low is there. Then, the development has to be planned to be considered, which takes into account the disaster risk management and climate change adaptation, etc., etc. So, it's a cycle, you see. Anyway, uh, uh, Tahir Saab, uh, if you are listening to me, if there are some questions, because I am just, you see, going at high speed. If people have some queries, not bad to answer right now. Nothing? Okay. So, now, speed of the hazard, how quick or how slow it could be. There could be sudden hazards like earthquakes, landslides, and floods. They normally take place with no warning. Normally, there is no warning, although some systems are being considered to give early warning in some in indirect manner. But you see, they are just in the infancy stage. I hope that in the coming decades, some good development may take place and we may have some early indication of the sudden hazards. Uh, but there are slow hazards, which I think if we look at them, with a keen eye, we can found out, find out there are droughts, coastal erosions, poor air quality, and creeping slides. Uh, you see, the difference between the two is that we can have a breathing time to plan the mitigation in case of slow hazards. And whereas for certain hazards, the mitigation becomes uh, very difficult to be planned. They don't give much, you see, time for the planning and it takes place all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction called UNISDR in 2009. So they listed the major disasters on the basis of their study and data. They said that decreasing agricultural leads in warmer environments to heat stress. They said yes, rising sea level is going to be there, it is there. More severe and frequent extreme precipitation events are going to be there and therefore changes in the geographic distribution of weather related hazards. This is important. And decreasing resilience and increasing poverty. This is what has been listed in the proper scientific and uh, economic study carried out by United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction. This becomes an important topic, the disaster reduction, first understanding the climate change effects. Uh, I think in future, uh, worldwide, the countries and the nations will have to spend a lot and have to keep this in, the plan, in their planning too. That's why almost in every country, there are climate change ministries and departments which have started their thinking, their research, and their work on these phenomena. Uh, you can see a melting Arctic and weird weather as a, as a consequence. Droughts, cold weather, snowstorm, heat waves and precipitation happened before also, yes. But their persistence, I mean, they are taking place for a longer time. Their intensity, I mean, becoming more harsh and frequency and taking place at less time interval. It is the new pattern which is starting to raise eyebrows now. This is now clear that the climate change effect because of our human reduced induced activities are giving prominence to different things. Volcanic eruption took place under a glacier in Iceland. And then because of that, the flights to the UK had to be cancelled. So much was emission of smoke and, you know, everything. But this phenomenon is also said to be related to the climate change effect. You can Im imagine an earth crust 
and uh, you can see that the volcanic activity is present you see at many places somewhere deeper somewhere shallow but you imagine you because it is basically coming uh, from the mountains from slopes where the stresses are unequal because of the weight effect so if the snow cover is removed by melting by high temperature the force which will be restraining uh, the upward rise of the volcanic matter that will reduce so simply from that logic of sigma fy is equal to zero the downward uh, retention force because of the snow melting reduces so upward stresses they increase so this volcanic activities and their increase is also linked too much to the anthropogenic climate change effects so you can see in Ireland shrinkage cracks because of uh, this kind of uh, shrinking soils. You see the same soils are swelling, highly swelling upon addition of water. Uh, in Pakistan, I could find, you see, many places in my long career where we have swelling and shrinking soil. And the maximum uh, swelling stress that I observed was near Kherpur, you see, near Kherpur, off National Highway around 10 tons per square foot. It is very high. But there are places, you see, where we have low order stress like this belt of uh, Gujranwala, Sialkot and uh, Narobal and Nandipur, where soil is collected for making cricket pitches. Those who are interested in cricket would have noticed that uh, cricket, uh, for building good cricket pitches, the soil is taken uh, from Nandipur. What is special in that? It is swelling soils, swelling clays. So if you make a pitch, I, I'm slightly off the topic, but it is the engineering. If you make a pitch using uh, swelling soil, it will become hard upon drying. And when you play cricket on a hard ground, when you throw a ball on a hard ground, there's more bounce. If there's more bounce, then the cricketer, you see, which is present on the trees, can hit more fours than sixes. So, a uh, crowd may enjoy more, you see, <laughs> on fast and bouncy uh, pitches, which are made of nandipul soil. So, anyway, I'm just telling you an effect, which is, in fact, engineering. Uh, so, you can see a hurricane in 2012, uh, recorded by NASA Observatory. You see where it was recorded, uh, parts of the New Jersey shoreline. It was there, right? So, you can see on the left-hand side, the uh, the shoreline view before uh, the event and after the hurricane event you can see here there's a breach and erosion and you see flooding of this populated area related to climate change effect so if you see if you look at the distribution related of the fatalities related to geohazard types. So you can see here that uh, in the world, snow avalanches, they have given rise to the maximum damages and then comes the clay slides, then rock avalanches. So this is the data uh, of Norway between 1845 and 1986, about one and a half century. This is how these nations, these people, they keep their data and plan on the light of the data further ahead. In Pakistan, during the 2010 uh, big flood, a picture shown uh, in the bottom at ja near Jakobabad Sakhav area, uh, there was a lot of damage. So upper figure taken in 2009 shows normal land and vegetation and everything, but then the effect of flood is there, you see, you can see. So this whole area, cultivated area was dropped, was uh, damaged. So very strong monsoon rains caused this, the industrial rivers were ordered to uh, inundate large areas and affected 15 to 20 million people, causing the worst flooding in a century. This extreme event caused significant damage to agriculture, to the properties of the people, and to the the livings of the people. Six million hectare of cultivable land was under flood. So it was big. 
Oh, here you see Hatiya Bala landslide dam. We can quote this also. You see, in 2005 earthquake on the Gilgit River, a big rock avalanche had taken place, so blocking the river. So at Hatiya Bala, I think you might be aware, many of you here on the right hand figure, you can see this mass sliding down from this area of the mountain and blocking the river here. Otherwise, this is a river course. And the famous Ataba landslide, Ataabad landslide, which took place in 2007, it blocked Hunza River with that rock avalanche. You see, Atabad rock avalanche, you can see coming here and blocking, blocking the river, you see. So, there are major devastations. Now, a dam, proper dam is going to be designed and planned at Atabad. Uh, in Israel, in 2010, due to long and intense dry weather, uh, wildfires were reported excessively. So you can see here smoke emission, and you see acute fire hotspots noticed in 2010. Uh, slow movement, sliding down at a high speed, at a steep slope, with considerable mass of snow, is called an avalanche. And we have plenty of such sites in our northern region. So if you look at this map, you see in the Arctic region, which is considered to be a cold region, excessive Arctic warming, the shade, the intensity of the shade of the color indicates warmer areas compared to the lightly shaded areas which are colder areas and the effect here rising sea water level sub, su submersion you see of the property and you can see badly cut uh, badly cut seashore and erosions on that so this is what happens to the seashores in Reading, Reading is a town in UK, so flooding with the people, you see, vehicles, they were, you see, down by, I think, more than, uh, like, one and a half foot or so. On the left-hand side, I think I can see a boat going in the same water. New Jersey, extreme weather effects, I mean, more than usual, more than normal, which that city has been experiencing. Effect of expensive soils on pavements, you see, you can see here. But what kind of degradation because of the upward, uplifting stresses on the pavement, total damage of the pavement. So in US, they have, you see, made a system in which they protect the highway, then highway 98 has been protected from the sea uh, action by using a buried 18 feet deep sheet pile wall and buried gabion matrix you see that is included here in this line, right? So tidal action shown here at US coast, but virtually it can take place as you, at any place. So Karachi and Balochistan coastal areas, we should not expect anything less. So earthquake damages, our, you see in the October 8, 2005 earthquakes where maximum damages took place for the structures located on slopes because landsliding was there. Mount St. Helens eruption in Washington related to, said to be related to the climate change effect. Uh, liquefaction damages. Change size because of change seismic pattern and risen groundwater levels in the coastal areas, both can do. In Amazon rainforest trees. These rainforest trees, you see, because of climate change effect, they have lesser age they die at a younger age because they absorb less carbon dioxide so that is the other harm otherwise 
the vegetation, the green greenery acts as a carbon sink. When there is less age, you see, then there is a problem, you see. You lose the carbon sink effect. By the end of century, global rough estimate is that even some mitigated measures are taken, you see. Even then, some 25% drop in the agri yield could be there by the end of this 21st century, which is not a good sign. Whereas population of the world is increasing and the, the, if the agri crop production reduces, survival of the human race will become difficult, you see. So climate change has to be grasped. So in order to control the ozone depletion effect, a uh, protocol was reached, you see, called Montreal Protocol, in which it was decided that effective measures will be taken to preserve the ozone layer to uh, minimize the spread of cancer, skin cancer. So you can see the scale on the right hand side, the thickness scale is called Dobson. 300 Dobson units or 3 mm. I mean, 100 Dobson is around 1, 1 mm. So you can see about more than 400 Dobson, like 450, more than 4, 450 or 500 Dobson, you see on the right hand side after the implementation of the Montreal Protocol. Before the Montreal Protocol, you can see lesser thickness in these areas of ozone. But now, ozone layer has started increasing in thickness right only three millimeter can you imagine this is what the climate change people you see you are working on this they, they are concentrating at this is what they are concentrating at <laughs> these small things which appear to us small are having big effects uh, so nasa captured this uh, tropical cyclone called zero one b over sri lanka mm -hmm. In Makkah 2014, flash floods related to this effect. In Pittsburgh in 2019, a bus full fell into a sinkhole which was developed in the ground. Of course, the sinkhole was developed because of the physical migration of material, so more underground flows. So climate change causes sinkhole, unstable bridges, and ruptured pipelines. Oh, I've already thrown light on swelling and shrinking phenomenon. And uh, they have been taking place in many parts of the world, wherever there are clay minerals. Here you can see in downtown Ottawa, big, big sinkhole. Huh? Where the material has gone? You see in the inhabited area, material has moved. It has migrated during underground flow, underground seepages of increased quantities. So this is what can ultimately happen, you see. Uh, we have seen, uh, I think you might have also seen, many places in Lahore where material migration has taken place under the road, inducing sinkholes and big cavities by material migration, you see. How does that take place? Maybe by suction uh, through the large diameter trunk sewer, like six and a half, seven feet diameter trunk sewers are there. If uh, their collars, their joints are not effective and some suction can take place and the material keeps moving, you see, over some time. So material migration is there. The phenomenon here may be different or maybe the same. I don't know. So similarly here you can see an embankment collapse, which resulted into derail derailment of the train in Saskatchewan in 2013 in Canada. Uh, how the tectonic movements can be induced uh, because of the shifting of waves on the earth's surface. So different pattern of tec uh, tectonic movement means different pattern of earthquakes. Here I sh show to you uh, in Murray area at Jika Gali. So f the famous or notorious Jika Gali slide took place around 2009 or so. So you can see on the left hand side the steep slope 
looks fairly stable. In fact, it is not stable. It has vegetation in it and it is holding the soil and you see drainage is, you see, almost uh, working well. So, <coughs> I would call this site as quasi-stable. But you see, a little disturbance here, little excavation which was started at the bottom of the slope which should never be done in an uncontrolled manner and in long reaches, but it was done during very heavy rainfall. So it caused the upper mass to get unstable and it ate up about half the width of the road, which was leading from Jikagali, this end, to Kulana, this end, which is a major traffic route for tourists. So there was a lot of uh, hue and cry during that uh, time. And... Uh, some stable slope systems were considered out of many options to control and contain the movements of the sliding mountain. So it was decided that a, a bit a butting to the road would be, should be given a reinforced earth embankment so that it is stronger against the lateral movements and development of strain. Then the lower part should be made uh, wider and thicker with plain earth to act as the restraining force, uh, a restraining toe against the movement. And this scheme worked very well. So this has been the first case of uh, uh, stabilizing a big landslide area uh, using uh, reinforced earth in Pakistan. And after completion, if you have visited Jika Gali, then you might have noticed, and if you have not noticed in your next visit, see, it was decided to give it a green face. So when the photo was taken, greenery has started growing in. But this whole mass is reinforced earth, having four feet, four sorry, four inches thick uh, polypropylene, strong end of polypropylene with embedded or impregnated uh, tendons of polyester. Polyester is a very tough material, which matches in its toughness to steel. And here. Uh, some studies were made uh, some years back in muddy at different places to to construct the cable cars. And so different routes, depending on different considerations, were adopted. And uh, since I was working on the projects, we had to abandon many routes where there were signs of instability, like this route was abandoned, you see, because it is very unstable. It has signs of past creeping or past movement. So how we can place our pylons, our pillars for the cable car in such unstable ground? This is called Dhobi Ghat area, Dhobi Ghat area in Murray. So at Basakali, if you have traveled from Basakali up to the Pindi Point uh, in the old chair lift, there's a terrace for car parking. It was decided to increase the size of the car parking area, the terrace, by uh, constructing a green face reinforced earth system. But somehow, in Murray, there are seepages, you see, which follow the path of least resistance. Somehow they were trapped, and that caused movement. You see, that caused movement of this uh, reinforced earth, earth part from this main uh, terrace. And uh, simplest Mayas were taken. Vertical and horizontal drainage uh, uh, pipes and the pumps were in, installed to draw the water out. And it worked very well. And it was only two months. You can check the dates from here up to here. In about two, two and a half months, the settlement markers showed that the movement was stabilized. So much pronounced is the effect of water on, the, on inducing instability or if they are, the water is taking, uh, taken out in reducing the instability. A uh, very big physical lesson which was based on actual measurements. Now, uh, I think uh, I will leave some time for question-answer session, so I think I can continue for 5-10 more minutes. So, let's talk of the two extreme uh, climate conditions. One is called the extreme drought of ports. The dry condition. So in this, uh, in the previous season, can cause high runoff and floods 
with intermediate rainfall and storm water infiltration in ground can also cause shallow landslides. In the wet weather can cause substantial rise in groundwater table, thereby triggering debris flow and landslides. So you see <laughs> both phenomena, whether extreme drought or extreme wet, both result into increase in the landsliding area, landsliding activity. Global warming and landslides. Some experts have really linked current levels of global warming with rock fall and landslides and in the mountain ranges. And of course, they have also linked this activity of global warming with earthquakes and some documentary evidences are there. And here, this is a map you see, which has been prepared by Munich Research, a catastrophe map of 2012. And you see, this shows that these, this is a world map. And uh, you see, they have uh, just plotted the catastrophes here. You can see Pakistan also, over that flood, which took place, the big flood, which took place in 2010, the Jakababad Sakhar flood. So you see, you can see the vulnerable areas, the whole world on the whole plot. A study was made in UK, very interesting study. It shows the relationship between little uh, probability of rise in temperature and the, the probability, the risk, the increase in the risk factor. For instance, a 1.2 degree rise is a, on the horizontal axis is the temperature, on the vertical is the accumulated probability of, uh, of the occurrence of a hazard. 1.2 degree centigrade rise gives rise to about 10% probability of geohazard occurrence, whereas 2.3 degree centigrade rise, 50% increase in the probability of risk. And only 3.2 degrees rise, 90% probability of exceedingly excessive geohazard. So this gives you a very clear idea that this one and two or three degrees are not small things in the climate change business and in their implications on the geohazards. Future floods, thank God that this map doesn't show any pronounced big, very big activity here. But experts have, you know, plotted this on the basis of study and which kind of future changes that to, to take place. In UK, they have done a very interesting study between the intensity of rainfall, occurrence of rainfall and the landslides. And there are many curves, but if you concentrate on just two curves, one is this uh, dash line, uh, this one, which indicates the rainfall, average rainfall, and this dotted line, average monthly landslides. So compare this dash with dotted. Wherever average monthly rainfall is high, the landslide activity is more pronounced. Wherever it is low, the landslide activity has reduced. So direct relationship, I also to, uh, showed to you our physical measurement at Basra Kali, that how in two or two and a half months, extraction of water from the slopes, that caused a lot of stability. So here you can also see a direct relationship, you see on the basis of a proper systematic study at UK. In China, they had to, you see, uh, uh, keep the reservoir rim, you see, at many places intact with bolts, you can see, bolts, this part, anchor bolt, uh, anchor cable reinforcement, reinforcement zone. So this kind of boating system has been done, you see, in the reservoir to hold the vertical or very steeply standing slopes. Natural versus anthropogenic factors. So there is a lot of debate about the relative contribution that which is more natural or human induced in tropical climate on 10 to 40 years time scale. That there is uh, mounting evidence that human cause particulate pollution has played a significant role in some of the recent events. So there is uh, uh, an agreement on that. 
and again comes the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction. This they warn, just very simply in a small sentence, the worst is yet to come. I think it is not a small small level of information. So this is what they have warned. If some effective steps uh, steps are not taken, and I showed you in the beginning uh, different scenarios and different models in which some models in which more effective mitigative measures are taken, the control in time pressure rise would be there and thereby changing the hazards uh, on this planet. If we talk of mitigation or controlling these events, mitigation of climate change factors in preventing and minimizing the climate change, which I, I have covered this in this lecture, but mitigation of geohazards themselves, you know, there are two things. The control over the climatic factors which induce geohazard, that is the main strategy. But the geohazards, once they occur, how to control them to reduce the minimum loss of life to property? That is not covered in this lecture. That is controlled by adopting general measures of civil engineering. Right? I think you get the difference. Uh, well, uh, we have already talked of this. Let's go ahead because time is less. Now, there are two things. Adaptation to climate change. So, adapting to life in a changing climate involves adjusting to actual or expected future climate. So, throughout history, people and societies have adjusted to and coped with the changes in the climate. Right? Climate change and drought in particular has been at least partly responsible for rise and fall of civilizations. Can you imagine how important this is? That it has its effect, its marks in the history. They, climate change has been responsible, whatever the factors behind, for the rise and fall of civilizations. Because, you know, old civilizations used to be near body of water. And in order to control the flood activity in the inhabitation, they used to be on the raised ground. Hence, Lahore's wall city is on raised ground. Earth's climate has been relatively stable for the past 12,000 years, and this stability has been crucial for the development of our modern civilization. So, low carbon future, how? We can have low carbon, so there are several measures and means, you see. There, are, there have to be strategies to be chalked out for control from industry and integrative industrial design, sustainable supply, the carbon-free electricity, you see electrical vehicles and fossil fuel, fuel production and better buildings, you see, flan, 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 etc., etc., education and training, keeping people awareness. Which countries have, are performing better on the climate change control factors and which are performing the worst? Unfortunately, I didn't find that what is our role, but India is performing, performing close to best. But the developed nations, look at them. Developed nations, they are performing the worst. Here they are having more money. So the bad effect, who are bad performers, the bad effect will be minimum on them. Look here. The climate survivability map. Now you can see India and Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is a bit slightly more danger than India. But you see, the maroon color is for the worst. And here you see now Russia and Canada and United States. They are, they are green and they are yellow. So their survivability because of better economies is much better. Similarly, you can see Australia here. And this is whole Europe. Europe, Australia, Canada, United States. Though they have a big <laughs> survivability map and they are the worst contributors to the climate change effect. So here you can say climate change per capita, high emissions, they don't care because they are industrial nations, they have so frequent air travel and you know which releases carbon dioxide and you know methane you see into the upper atmosphere. So they are mainly responsible and poor nations, vulnerability challenge you see. <coughs> Uh, we uh, emit very low, but we are more vulnerable. Look at Pakistan's plight. Our contribution to greenhouse gas is only about 0.8%. 
whereas our population contribution to the globe is like 2.8 percent. So, if considered from the proportion of population, our contribution to the emission of gases is less. Pakistan's vulnerability to hazards of all types is very high due to poor economy. A 1 to 2 degree rise in temperature is likely to cause extinction to vegetation and life to the tune of 20 to 30 percent. Very serious. So, well, mitigation and adaptation strategies in mitigation, you see, you start using electrical vehicles and clean energy and, you know, this and that. In adaptation, you take action to manage the risks of climate change, you see, flood protection measures and, you know, infrastructure upgrades, etc. Et and disaster management strategies. Okay, we leave this. So, cloud seeding experimentation, you see, this is being done in many countries. It was tried in, uh, I think, in Pakistan, in Punjab area too. I think it was not the very excessive because for the effective cloud, cloud seeding, note that silver iodide, which is used mainly, not only that it has to be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, sprayed in good quantity, but one has to know that whether the clouds which are going to be seeded with this have a lot of moisture and water vapor formation or not. It was not that effective, but this is a very good method in which uh, either from aeroplane or from a ground source, silver iodide can be sprayed on the cloud. And uh, what happens is that silver iodide aids in the formation of ice crystals. Now, too heavy to remain in the air, the ice crystals then fall, often melting on their way uh, to us, looking like rain particles. Our domain. Pakistani government. Government and individuals should play their roles. We people, the engineers, architects, planners, etc., must learn a variety of climate change aspects and must prepare legal framework for this and uh, planning of towns and water resources with reference to Pakistani climate. There are various methods for communicating to the public the geohazard risk. Today is the era of media. So there are several mediums available, the printed media or electronic media. There are areas of workshops and, you know, newsletters and email, etc., etc. And in this respect, our government, government of Pakistan, has cre already created a Ministry of Climate Change, MOCC, and other forums, which are Pakistan Climate Control Authority and Pakistan, under that, Pakistan Climate Change Authority, Climate Control and Climate Change Authority. To monitor and implement the international agreement, Pakistan is a signatory to many international agreements for climate change and to mitigate their effects and national adaptation plan related to climate change. So, I have ended here and some time is there for your question. I would request Tahir Saab the mode he wants as the moderator to allow questions if somebody wants to speak out. I am available, and if uh, uh, Tahir Sahib, you want to read out some messages, please let me know. Thank you, Suhail, for a, a detailed and a wonderful lecture. Uh, you have explained uh, Thank you. Uh, the topic that is climate change and geohazards very well. I think everybody would have understood the uh, geotechnical engineering's connection with climate change. That was uh, uh, quite wonderful. Now we have some uh, questions that uh, I can see. Just the questions have arrived just now. So this is the first question is from Shahid Ijaz. And he's right. ask, he asking, uh, so much dust in urban areas of Pakistan, especially in central Punjab and below areas belongs to erosion soil. What are remedial measures against controlling this phenomena? What damages this eroded soil cause to the infrastructure? Uh, basically, uh, presence of dust causes increased uh, accumulation of uh, particles uh, in the atmosphere, which is enveloping the earth. So, uh, talking by the same analogy that I have explained and discussed in my lecture, when there is sunlight, sun rays, you see, they will be getting reflected again and again, thus, tra thus uh, trapping the heat within the atmosphere, one. And secondly, you see, they may act as a nucleus for uh, water vapors 
to accumulate and you know forming a kind of smog which we call smog nowadays in low temperature so it is the effect that we are seeing here and it effect you see if it is not if it is not controlled i mean a control is you know control has to be by measures you see which government should implement the dust you see we should not have uh, areas where dust can you see fly uh, with traffic or otherwise with air you see paving and you see uh, turfing you see and having good drainage so that you see uh, the water which results from rain and you see other sources that flows into the drain and you see there is no accumulation of that i think that is one thing and secondly control over burning of the fossil and of the of the waste you see that is very important the burning of the crops and in punjab in particular the news that we hear that a lot of smoke and carbon dioxide comes from burning of the crops from indian border also from our eastern side so that is also an issue so these measures have to be taken to control over spread of these things so that our infrastructure is if, uh, effectively controlled measures have to be taken by planners by architects by engineers you see in their designs as i've told you that we must concentrate against flooding on pervious uh, infrastructure uh, pervious pervious landscape and we must also a concentrate on not leaving many areas without turfing or without paving so that will eliminate the possibility of you see this dust present on the ground you see if you visit some advanced countries like europe and america we all know that there's almost no dust very low quantity of dust our shirts they remain clean at the collar our shoes remain dust free but here it is not the situation so thus has to be controlled by adopting certain policies and measures ji that's up next ji thank you so hell i hope uh, mr ijaz have got the uh, shahid ijaz has got the answer to his question now next question is from mr rizwan mirza he is asking paving and construction have already reduced ground water recharge hasn't it yeah it has not been used effectively it in lahore i would say or in the cities like lahore where we have a lot of high permeability thick deposits of high permeability soil underneath i think this is a effective way to take the drainage down vertically and that will effectively recharge the groundwater and we already draw Uh, the potable water from more than thousand feet now in Lahore. So uh, during the course of downward flow, some impurities or some you know biological bad effects they will be all removed. You see, I think some concentration has to be uh, f- focused on this issue. Uh, less has been practiced. You see, I think more needs to be practiced. Next. Okay, the third question is from uh, engineer Latif Bhatti, and he is on Facebook now, and uh, he is asking that you have mentioned about Jika Gali parking uh, parking plaza, yeah. and this had project had to be abandoned at a very exorbitant cost. So, are there any lessons uh, regarding geotechnical engineering or uh, uh, environment that could be learned from that project? Yeah. there are many lessons uh, but mr latif bhatti sahab a uh, one is a good coordination and understanding between the client body between the designer the consultant and between the coordination uh, basically that unfortunate incident took place because of the unrealistic targets given to the designers and to the contractors and unfortunately there was such a great hurry and mess that the standard norms of geotechnical engineering were ignored and everybody was looking at that but since the targets were unrealistic so you know as i explained to you we forbid this thing uh, you see if there is a steep slope and we know that mari is a quasi stable uh, area uh, you see opening up at the toe of a steep slope and that too in the heavy rainfall it's just inviting the slide 
there are norms and ways of avoiding slides in such areas that you open up in small stretches, number one, and then uh, give temporary support to, uh, to the excavated areas. It was never done. And I also have the information without naming anyone that the contractor, you see a project's success, we are civil engineers, we know that despite every odd or good thing, ultimately the success of a project hinges heavily on the resourcefulness, on the knowledge, on the capability and on the will of the contractor. The contractor was having no experience of working in that environment. In such, Murray is one of the most treacherous environment for uh, rendering civil engineering works. So, Patisar, these are the things that we as engineers should know, not to bow under the uh, stresses uh, and the pressures of uh, uh, politicians and, you know, uh, the people who control the activity, which we should show in the future more guts to tell them the truth. And we should always not so, yes, sir, yes, sir, and then these things happen. Next, see. Uh, your mic is muted. Please open your mic. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Now we have a question from Suhail Raza. And he is asking, as per your knowledge, has the government of Pakistan made a noticeable national policy on construction in landslide prone zones, particularly in northern Pakistan? Uh, uh, Mr. Suhail Raza, thank you for your question. Uh, you see, such uh, activities of uh, uh, making national policies in geotechnical engineering matters uh, hinge a lot on the funds and the will, uh, you see, funds released by the government and on the will to, to control these things. I remember having worked as a in charge project manager that is called of a project to develop a landslide hazard zonation map in the whole Murray area. I think when like 30% work was done, the governments changed. And then despite best efforts, it could not be uh, resumed. And then you see the whole money has uh, gone waste. This is how we work in Pakistan. You see that, that is very bad. I think there is a dire need to have such hazard maps for different parts covering different hazards which are possible in different parts of the country. Next see. Yeah, now let me see on the uh, Facebook if we have any further questions. There is nothing here. And uh, in the chat box, I just got another question. Right. From it is from Shahid Ijaz. And he's Shahid Ijaz. Asking, yeah. He's asking, the effect of climate change is affecting countries which are not producing much higher footprints, for example, due to carbon dioxide emissions from India and China. In Pakistan, extreme and extended weathers are observed. What we need to do to save our people? Well, we need to do what has been discussed in the lecture. I think uh, I've talked... Uh, about the mitigation strategies. We are all poor economies. They have to go by the same approach. You see, when we have less money, we have to go by adaptation as much as possible by changing our lifestyle and uh, making those measures. you see. So this is how we have to go. Yeah, please, next. Yeah, now we have no question on the in the chat box, neither on the, or uh, neither on the Facebook, and uh, almost our time is also over. Uh, okay, one last question I got from Saima Abdul Majid, and uh, let's take the question from the lady. Uh, what measures shall be taken in developing urban areas, master plans, housing schemes, industrial estate zones to reduce climate change? Mm. Thank you. Good question by the only lady questioner. Are you an is she an architect or an engineer? Can I know this thing? Yes, uh, Miss Saima, 
if you can reply to the speaker's question. Engineer, she's an engineer. Okay, right. You see, uh, we have to take those measures which will reduce the temperature effect in, you see, in, in the small limited inhabitations like a housing colony and a personal uh, a house in that or a building in that, like a building if which absorb more heat, you see. So it will have its own effect. The building which reflects more heat because of, you see, the architectural rendering will have its own effect. But you see, every I would focus on this that every small community must exercise this thing that uh, their solid waste is not burned. Number one, number two, water is not accumulated and drainage is facilitated. So that would require some pervious arrangement. You see. I've seen in some examples, some even pervious, partly pervious roads too, uh, which allow water to drain out. But there should be longitudinal drains and there should be lateral transverse drains. So uh, this uh, local, in a small local environment, the burning of the waste and the plants and you see junk, which yields a lot of carbon dioxide, I think that must be avoided and as I've told you turfing is a good solution or if paving has to be done uh, it should be uh, with the per some partially pervious arrangement so these kinds of things and some policies needs to be framed out you see by by, by the controlling department like uh, housing and physical planning or even Pakistan engineering council and Pakistan council of uh, architects and town planners they can play their role. That this is the national agenda. I think they should feed the national action plan on this. You see, the, the government's body, they should be able to feed to them that these are our preferences and these are the areas on which we must work. I don't know how effective their current coordination is. Okay, now we have another question or a comment from uh, Rizwan Virda. He is saying, uh, asking or saying, what should I say? First thing would be to let the engineers have access to the data available with geological survey and meteorological department. Would you like to say yeah. something? Yeah, I think this is a comment. Yeah, they have that department may be having better data, but uh, the old data record may not be there, but nevertheless, whatever they have, and GSP also have some good record and uh, that may that is as a first step yeah that is right you see this is how whenever we carry out such hazard zonation studies or things like that we make use of that but in order to prepare a national plan that would be the first step yes of course and data not only from them but also from other credible agencies can also be obtained from good consultants good data is reliable because the reliability of data the credibility of data is very important. Anything, any planning which comes with the improper or faulty data results into kind of fault. Then we have to see that to what extent as a poor country we can invest and what are our right preferences. And uh, you see there, uh, there is a way to uh, not to allow people to construct in areas which are subjected to dangerous earthquake activity or the areas where we have pronounced flood activity like it took place last year also. So such policies need to be made in which the people are not affected too much to the climate change effect. And there are then social factors also which uh, go side by side with the physical factors, with the technical factors. Hello, uh, yeah, so, ji. yeah, yeah. I thought there was some technical hitch. Anyhow, now I have two questions, and the, these would be the last two questions. And these okay. both have both have been asked by Muhammad Naim Bashir Awan. His first okay. question is his first question is during winter season, some regions are blocked due to heavy snowfall, except tunnels 
accept tunnel is there any other economical option in your opinion this is the first question answer it then mm -hmm. i'll uh, ask you the second, last question well uh, you see when there is uh, heavy it, snowfall it, and it, that... the, the second one is connected with the first one let me read it too just like Nipa, Azad, Kashmir, they demand tunnel, but national government is not approving the tunnels. Short answer, please. Well, you see, we have to adopt those measures which the people who are experiencing similar things they have been adopting. So what I mean is that, uh, you see, we have a lot of snowfall in many countries in the world. You see Canada, where temperatures remain like minus 30, minus 40, minus 50 degrees centigrade. Yes, survivability is there. Cleaning of the roads and you see, making such an arrangement that you can survive from temperature point of view within the buildings you see, etc, etc. Uh, if there is a tunnel and if there is a blockade of the, you see, access to the tunnel, of course, that can also be done, you see. It is a matter of doing and planning. Uh, in many areas, if there is a road and uh, we can have a kind of overhang structure over that, so that we don't let the glacier to affect the working of the road, the glacier mass can be, uh, you see, made to pass, to cross over that overhang structure and uh, fall directly on the valley side. So there are various means uh, which are possible to be done in those difficult areas. And then there are areas of uh, permanent frost and, uh, you know, called permafrost. And then uh, also there are areas, you see, in which there is ground freezing as a seasonal activity. So they are, uh, like in Norway, I was uh, studying their technology. What do they do? Because there is a lot of uh, uh, ground warping because of the uh, uh, swelling of soil upon... Uh, freezing uh, between 4 degrees centigrade and 0 degrees centigrade when there is a gain in the volume of the soil when it freezes from 4 to 0 degree. So, you see, even there are some uh, roads are in a very bad condition because of that. But, you see, if we have a draining system, we provide the uh, roads with uh, constructed with the good draining material, then the problem is uh, reasonably resolved. There are soils which are good in drainage, there are soils which are poor in drainage, and there are soils which don't let the water seepage in. Like clays are fine permeability soil, they don't let water in. Gravels and sand, they drain quickly. So they are more resistant to the uh, warping uh, kind of activity during very cold weather. If you have seals, they tend to retain water. Uh, for a longer time, and when the cold weather is there, we will see the damages. The damage is much more than what the damages one expects in swelling soils. So I think I have done it short. <laughs> Eyes up, mute your... Uh, Thank yeah. you very much for your answers, and uh, I wish I had more time to take more questions as the, this interactive discussion was going on very well. So, but... Unfortunately, we have to conclude it here. And uh, uh, so, here, thank you very much again for your uh, here and uh, for your time and your uh, eloquence uh, while delivering the lecture. That was wonderful. So now, uh, lady and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this uh, lecture. And uh, so here your uh, certificate on your field, inshallah, will be dispatched to you by courier you. mail. Sadia will take care of that. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can collect your certificates uh, from uh, our office uh, 20, from 25th January onwards. And address I will just uh, uh, tell you now, it is 14A1 Block P, Model Town Extension, Lahore. I repeat, 14A1 Block P, Model Town Extension, Lahore. And uh, before coming, if you want to check, check with the person here. He is Ahmad Akram. I could, I could hear some. It is the contact person is Ahmad Akram, and his telephone number. Four seven four seven. One connect. Is that? Did you, can you mute yourself, uh, gentlemen? My class is cut off. You can
Mike, please, gentlemen, mute your mic. Uh, so I was saying that before coming, if you want to call uh, our staff for the certificates, the person is Ahmed Akram and his uh, cell number is 0347-462-5311. So now we are at the end of the section. My thanks to all of you again for attending this webinar here uh, in uh, on Zoom and those who have attended on Facebook. Thank you very much for supporting us and for attending the lecture. My special thanks to my team on the IT person Hasnan and my coordinator Sa Sa Sadia Naveed. Without them, this telecast would not have been that smooth. They are, they are working very hard uh, in the background. So this is why I have mentioned their names so that you know there are people working in the background also. So thank you very much. Allah bless you all. I will, uh, yeah, one announcement. The next lecture is on 10th for, uh, February, 2024. The topic is role of civil engineering in shaping the world. And the speaker is engineer Muhammad Hassan Malik. I repeat on 10th February, 2024. And the topic is role of civil engineering in shaping the world. The speaker is engineer, engineer Muhammad Hassan Malik. So the, this is the point where we are con uh, concluding. And uh, inshallah, I will see you on 10th February. Till then, Allah bless you all. <laughs>